Henry VIII's biggest mistake. The real story of Anne of Cleves. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves for a royal scandal that will shake everything you thought you knew about Tudor history. Welcome to our channel, where we're about to uncover the shocking truth behind one of history's most misunderstood queens. You've heard the rumours, you've seen the unflattering portraits, but what if I told you that Anne of Cleve, the so-called ugly wife of Henry VIII, might be the most brilliant player in the deadly game of Tudor politics? Buckle up, history lovers, because we're about to take you on a wild ride through betrayal, deception, and a twist ending that will leave you speechless. Picture this, a young German princess thrust into the spotlight as the bride of Europe's most notorious king. Kingen was known for beheading wives faster than he changed his doublet. The stage is set for disaster, or is it? Was Anne indeed the plain, dull woman history has painted her to be? Or was she playing a long game that would ultimately outsmart the grand Henry VIII himself? In the next few minutes, we'll peel back the layers of lies and half-truths to reveal the honest Anne of Cleves. Trust me, folks, by the end of this video, you'll be questioning everything you thought you knew about Tudor history. We'll take you from the glittering courts of Germany to the treacherous halls of Hampton Court. You'll witness the disastrous first meeting between Anne and Henry that set tongues wagging across Europe. So, was rejecting Anne of Cleves truly Henry's biggest blunder? Was this ugly queen the smartest of them all? And how did she manage to keep her head and become one of England's wealthiest women? Stay tuned, because we're about to uncover all this and more. Trust me, you want to see the ending of this incredible tale. Get ready to gasp, laugh, and maybe even shed a tear as we dive into the true story of Anne of Cleves, the woman who just might have been Henry VIII's biggest mistake. Part 1. Anne's early life and the European political landscape Anne of Cleves was born on September 22nd, 1515, in Dusseldorf, to John III, Duke of Cleve, and Maria of Jewish Burg. Her birth coincided with a period of immense change in Europe, as the Protestant Reformation was about to sweep across the continent, challenging the authority of the influential Catholic Church. Anne's father, John III, ruled over much of what is now North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. As the winds of religious change blew across Europe, John decided to shape his family's future. He allied himself with the Schmalkaldic League, a defensive alliance of Lutheran princes within the Holy Roman Empire. This alliance was further cemented when Anne's elder sister, Sibyl, married John Frederick Bohemond, who would later become the Schmalkaldic League's leader and a Protestant cause champion. These close ties to the Protestant movement would make the Cleves family attractive potential allies for rulers across Europe who were looking to forge Protestant alliances. At the tender age of 12, Anne was betrothed to Francis, the ten-year-old heir to the Duchy of Lorraine in France. However, this engagement remained purely formal due to their young ages. It's worth noting that such betrothals were common among noble families of the time, often used as political tools to forge alliances and secure future power. Anne's upbringing was typical for a noblewoman of her time and place. She received a limited formal education, focusing primarily on the necessary skills for a future wife and consort. She could read and write in German, but needed to be versed in other languages or more advanced subjects. Her strict mother raised her to be an obedient and pleasing wife, adhering to the era's expectations. For many years, Anne's life seemed to follow a predictable path. She would likely marry the Duke of Lorraine, and live out her days as a German noblewoman in France. Little did anyone know that fate had other plans for Anne to intertwine her life with some of the most significant figures in English history. Part two, the search for Henry VIII's fourth wife. In 1539, Anne's life took an unexpected turn that would thrust her onto the world stage. King Henry VIII of England, recently widowed after the death of his third wife, Jane Seymour, was on the hunt for a new bride. Henry's break from the Catholic Church in 1529 had made him enemies across Europe, including the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. With the threat of invasion looming, particularly from Catholic Spain, Henry desperately needed like-minded Protestant allies. Henry's advisers, led by Thomas Cromwell, began scouring Europe for suitable candidates 
who could fulfill two crucial criteria. They needed to be Protestant and pleasing to the king. The search was extensive, with multiple candidates being considered simultaneously. However, Henry was notoriously picky, and his reputation preceded him. His treatment of his previous wives had not gone unnoticed in European courts. When 16-year-old Christina of Denmark was approached as a potential bride, she reportedly quipped, If I had two heads, one should be at the King of England's disposal. This witty remark speaks volumes about Henry's reputation and the apprehension felt by potential brides. To ensure his satisfaction, Henry sent his court painter, Hans Holbein the Younger, to capture the likenesses of potential brides. Holbein was renowned for his ability to create strikingly accurate portraits, a skill that had caught Henry's eye a decade earlier. His task was to give the King King Assis representation of these women, allowing Henry to make an informed decision without leaving England. In this context, Anne of Cleves first came to the attention of the English court. Thomas Cromwell, eager to secure a Protestant alliance, began to promote the idea of a marriage between Henry and either Anne or her sister, Amalia. Cromwell, who had never seen Anne in person, is said to have painted a glowing picture of her to the king, kingsibly exaggerating her charms to further his political agenda. Intrigued by the possibility, Henry agreed to consider the Cleves sisters more seriously. In the spring of 1539, portraits of Anne and Amalia were shown to Henry's envoys. However, the envoys insisted on seeing the women in person before making any recommendations to the king. King at three, the first impressions and portraits. When Henry's envoys finally arrived in Cleves to meet Anne and Amalia in person, they encountered an unexpected obstacle, German fashion. The sisters' dresses and headwear were large and heavy, often including veils that obscured their features. When the envoys requested a closer look, they were met with conservative German resistance, with one courtier sarcastically asking if the envoys would like to see the girls naked. Despite these difficulties, Henry's envoy, Richard Beard, returned to England in late July 1539 with a portrait of Anne, believed to be the work of German artist Barthel Bruin the Elder. This portrait, which wasn't identified as Anne of Cleves until 1855, provides an exciting insight into how Anne was first presented to Henry. X-ray analysis of this portrait revealed that the artist had initially painted Anne with a slightly larger nose, which was later revised. This alteration raises questions about the portrait's accuracy and possible attempts to make Anne appear more attractive to the English king. Interestingly, an almost exact copy of this portrait, long believed lost, resurfaced at the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia. Given the exceptional skill level displayed, some historians speculate that this might be a Holbein portrait of Anne. Regardless of its origin, it's possible that this was the first image of Anne that Henry saw. However, Henry was only partially satisfied with this initial portrait. He requested that Holbein paint a more detailed likeness of Anne. The result was the now famous portrait of Anne of Cleves, which we know for sure was painted from life. Holbein travelled to Durin to capture Anne's likeness on parchment, indicating that he painted her at the court rather than working from a sketch back in London. Upon completion of Holbein's work, a member of Anne's court remarked that it was a good likeness. When Henry saw this portrait, he was overjoyed. He found Anne beautiful in the painting and became even more enthusiastic about the match. This positive reaction set the stage for the negotiations that would soon follow. Part four, the fateful meeting. As negotiations progressed, Anne began her journey to England by New Year's Day 1540, she had crossed the English Channel and was less than 100 miles from Hampton Court. Henry, impatient and romantic, decided he couldn't wait for the official meeting. Instead, he enacted one of his favourite courtly love traditions, disguising himself as a lowly knight to test his bride-to-be's love. The idea was rooted in the belief that true love would allow Anne to recognise Henry despite his disguise. However, this romantic notion would soon lead to an awkward and potentially disastrous encounter. The ambassador Eustace Chapwis described the scene. The king so went up into the chamber where the said Lady Anne was looking out of a window to see the bull baiting which was going on in the courtyard. 
and suddenly he embraced and kissed her and showed her a token which the king king sent her for New Year's gift. And she being abashed and not knowing who it was, thanked him and so he spoke with her. But she regarded him little but always looked out the window. And, unaware of this English custom and not expecting to meet the king king Uch in a manner, was understandably flustered. She didn't recognize Henry who was no longer the handsome, athletic man of his youth by this time. A leg wound from a few years earlier had left him unable to be physically active and he had begun to gain weight. The portraits of Henry circulating in Europe then did not reflect these physical changes. Imagine Anne's shock when a large, unfamiliar man suddenly entered her room and kissed her. Her awkward reaction, while entirely understandable, was perceived as a slight by the egotistical Henry. He left immediately, taking the gifts he had brought for her, and began what can only be described as a smear campaign to soothe his bruised ego. On the journey back to his palace, Henry complained, saying, she is nothing so fair as has been reported, and expressed shock at her plain appearance. This moment marked the beginning of Anne's reputation as the ugly wife, a label that would unfairly stick with her for centuries. Part five, descriptions of Anne. To understand the truth behind Anne's appearance, we need to examine the various descriptions of her from that time. It's important to note that these descriptions often conflict, reflecting the biases and agendas of those providing them. We know that Anne was taller than average and very slim. One description noted that she had a brown complexion, darker than the late Queen Jane Seymour's. However, it's crucial to understand that English skin tone descriptions at the time must be taken with a grain of salt. For instance, Anne Boleyn, who we would consider fair-skinned by modern standards, was described as swarthy by her contemporaries. The English ideal of beauty at the time was essentially pure white. The color of Anne's hair is not definitively known, although based on the color of her eyebrows in several portraits, it was likely light brown or blonde. Her sister Sibyl is shown with red or gold red hair in portraits, suggesting this could have also been a possibility for Anne. Interestingly, the descriptions of Anne by those who met her on her way to marry the king are mainly positive. Lady Lyle wrote that Anne was so good and gentle to serve and please. William Fitzwilliam, who received her at Calais, praised her in letters to the king, kinging, saying that she had as good a grace and countenance as ever in all my life I saw any noblewoman. Others reported that Anne was kind and eager to please. She thanked her host often and showed curiosity about English culture and traditions. Despite still learning English, she was happily chatting with everyone she met. However, English sources may have been inclined to be overly kind in their descriptions, given the political importance of the match. Foreign descriptions, with less of an agenda to please, seem more willing to be honest. The French ambassador Marillac wrote, according to several who have seen her close, she does not seem so young as expected, nor so beautiful as everyone affirmed. She is tall and has assurance in her carriage and countenance, giving the impression that vivacity of spirit will supply as much beauty as one could desire. Part six, the marriage and its aftermath. Despite Henry's initial disappointment, the political importance of the match meant that the marriage went ahead. Henry and Anne were married on January 6th, 1540, just five days after their first meeting. The phrase, God send me well to keep, was engraved on Anne's wedding ring, a poignant detail given what was to come. On their wedding night, a small crowd gathered to witness the consummation of the marriage, as was customary for royal unions. However, things went differently than planned. Henry once again blamed Anne's appearance for his inability to consummate the marriage. He even went so far as to have his doctor testify that he wasn't impotent, claiming he had experienced nocturnal pollutions twice, so the fault must lie with the Queen. Despite this humiliating turn of events, Anne remained gracious and humble. She spoke kindly of Henry to her ladies-in-waiting, saying, When he comes to bed, he kisses me, takes me by the hand and bids me, Good night, sweetheart, and in the morning, he kisses me and bids me, farewell, darling. However, Henry's attention quickly turned elsewhere. He began flirting with other women at court, paying little attention to Anne in public. 
his eye was particularly caught by a young woman named Catherine Howard. Anne was asked to leave the royal court six months after the wedding. She agreed without protest or anger when informed that the marriage had been annulled. This graceful acceptance may have been part of a longer game that Anne was playing. In the annulment settlement, Henry gave Anne such a large settlement that she became one of the wealthiest women in England overnight. She was given Richmond Palace, Hever Castle, the childhood home of Anne Boleyn, and a house in East Sussex. The woman considered too ugly for King Henry may have been the only one to beat him at his own game truly. Part 7. Anne's Later Life and Legacy Contrary to what one might expect, Anne's story didn't end with her divorce from Henry. Her life after the annulment was more exciting and fulfilled than her time as queen. Over the years following the annulment, Anne was invited back to court multiple times. She and Henry struck up an unlikely friendship. Whether due to her graceful handling of the annulment or some private understanding between them, Henry showed his gratitude towards Anne on many occasions. Anne became an honorary royal family member and was called the King's beloved sister. Henry even decreed that she be given precedence over all women in England besides the Queen and his daughters. This elevated status speaks volumes about the respect and affection Henry came to hold for Anne. Anne navigated the changing political landscape in the turbulent years that followed with remarkable skill. She became good friends with Henry's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth Tudor, and was present at Mary's coronation procession. Despite being brought to England as a Protestant alliance, Anne showed her political acumen by converting to Roman Catholicism under Mary's rule. However, Anne's close relationship with Elizabeth Tudor eventually led to a loss of favour with Queen Mary. After Wyatt's rebellion, a Protestant plot to overthrow Mary, the Queen became convinced that the Lady of Cleve was involved in intrigues to help Elizabeth. Anne finally retired to a quiet life after the tumultuous succession battles between the Tudor siblings. She lived out her days at Chelsea Manor, outliving Henry and his other wives. Anne of Cleves died on July 16, 1557, and was buried in Westminster Abbey, opposite one of the first kings of England, a final testament to her enduring importance. As we conclude our exploration of Anne of Cleves' life, it's clear that she was far more than the ugly wife of Henry VIII. She was an intelligent, graceful, and politically savvy woman who managed to navigate the treacherous waters of Tudor politics better than almost anyone else of her time. Her careful handling of Henry's ego, dignified response to the annulment, and subsequent rise to prominence all point to a woman of considerable intelligence and charm. Her close relationships with Mary and Elizabeth Tudor, two women who would go on to shape English history, further underscore her importance. As for her appearance, it seems fair to say that Anne was likely an average-looking woman of her time neither strikingly beautiful nor particularly unattractive. Beauty, after all, is subjective and culturally defined. To modern eyes, her portraits reveal a woman no less attractive than Henry's other wives. Unfortunately, Henry's initial rejection of Anne made it fashionable to speak ill of her appearance, words that have echoed through history. However, Recent scholarship has begun to paint a more nuanced picture of Anne, recognising her as perhaps the luckiest and most successful of Henry's wives. Anne of Cleves' story reminds us of the importance of looking beyond surface-level historical narratives. It encourages us to dig deeper, question long-held assumptions, and strive for a more nuanced understanding of historical figures. Thank you for joining us on this journey through history. Until next time, keep exploring, questioning, and bringing history to life.